Jesus. And we're going to get right into the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Can you guys hear me? Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Mark 12 and verse 12. Mark 12 and verse number 12. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Mark 12, verse number 12, and the Bible says, and they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken a parable against them, and they left him and went their way, and they left him and went their way. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word tonight, Lord, and I ask you to help me tonight, amen, I I ask you to help me to deliver this the way that you gave it to me. And I thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. One of the most eye-opening realizations in my life, the things that I have come to the conclusion is when reality slapped me right across the face. And I think that thought or that statement really segues into this next lesson. During our previous lesson, if you remember, we learned about loyalty and we learned about boundaries, respecting one another's property. And the reason why we respect one another's property is because Everybody has rights. Everybody has a right to their, their privacy, I guess I could say. We discovered when a person is loyal in their relationship with someone else, they are being good stewards of God's vineyard. In chapter 12, Really digging into this chapter, it's really powerful. And we can see Mark is describing a group of people whom were given multiple chances to correct their behavior, but they chose not to. In fact, the Bible says in Mark chapter 3, or Mark chapter 12, verses 3 through 5, that the keeper of the fields were vengeful when their faults were pointed out to them. They tried to claim something that, was, that they were stewards of for themselves. 
It says in verse 3, they caught one and beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent unto them another servant. And at him, they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And again, he sent another and him they killed and many others beating some and killing some. He's really describing Jesus, the prophets, all these men that God had sent, these prophets who had sent the word and tried to get Israel back on track. And then he sent his son, or he came in flesh, should I, should I say. And they strung him up on an old rugged cross. If you remember the the title of my last message, it was basically the, the outcast. The outcast. And that's exactly what they did to God. They cast him out. They no longer wanted him to be part of their life. This is a continuation of that story. Because even though they knew who he was, in a sense, they didn't like what he was doing. They didn't want to give up control. Even though God sent word and tried to correct their behavior, they didn't want to change. They didn't want to alter the course that they were traveling down. They wanted to do things the way that they wanted to do things. The sad result of removing Jesus from our lives, removing God from the school systems and, and on and on and on, and we could that, that's a whole other series that we could talk about. The progression of removing God from our lives, and I'm talking about society, is living a life without him and ultimately facing judgment for our actions. The Bible even says in, 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 in one area, and we're going to touch on that, that there is a place that we can get to where we can no longer have a relationship with God because we have been self-deceived or, or the, the world, I keep saying we, not us, but the world, mankind, falls into this state of self-deception. One thought that came to my mind, which could be implied in Mark chapter 12, is there are people in God's kingdom who have been given talents, who have been given abilities to be productive in their individual lives or individual calling, I guess I could say. And so the church, the body of Christ, must recognize that God has put in place spiritual boundaries. Everyone say spiritual boundaries. Spiritual boundaries that we should all be aware of. And the more we realize these boundaries or our boundaries, the more God will empower the church to fulfill God's great calling. God's great calling. Calling means to see God's purpose the way that God sees it. Not the way that I see it, but the way that God sees it. And so how does a person with such gifts and talents and abilities, how do they fall away? How do they lose out with God permanently? 
Well, sometimes when things don't go right, some people become so offended when the word of God begins dealing with that individual, when God begins to try to change their behavioral patterns that they get offended and they lose out with God. And I believe, this is just me, but I believe that this pattern starts in the heart. And so the tendency is to criticize God, criticize his voice, criticize his, his word. We want to silence the word of God. We want to criticize what God is trying to do in our lives. And we see this in Mark chapter 12, verses 3 to 5. They wanted to silence God's word. They wanted to silence God's ways. One of the greatest scriptures in the word of God is found in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. And it says, without counsel, purposes are disappointed. They fall apart. There's no value. There's no foundation. That's why we need a multitude of counselors. Because within a multitude of counselors, God's purposes become a reality. They can be established. They are stable. And that's because God's word speaks to us, the church, through many avenues. God uses many voices, but there's only one source, and that's God himself. If you've ever been through the Search for Truth Bible study, and I recommend that we all go through that a couple times, that there are 32 writers who were inspired or God breathed God's breath, God breathed into them to write thoughts on ancient parchments. And those words were written so they could eventually guide the church, his people, through years and years of history. Without the word of God, we would be lost. Amen. We wouldn't know how to hear God's voice. And the word of God is God's mind on paper. That's all it is. And it's alive and it never dies. It's constantly reaching and it's constantly teaching. It teaches us about these spiritual boundaries, boundaries on how to act and how to listen, how to live for God the way that God wants us to live. Praise God. We try to take our life in our own hands, but God wants to teach us how to walk in his ways, his thoughts, his beliefs. You see, the Bible, the word of God, it has solutions for life's issues because every day, we are challenged in life. And if we're willing to accept the challenges, God's word can be very beneficial to us, can help us, can guide us. We can learn of everything that we, we, we face, praise God. We use it and we see it as God trying to help us and correct us. It's awesome. And when we get off track, we repent. Sometimes we look at that word and we don't really understand what it means. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that, that we face trials and it's the goodness of God that, that, that he brings us to this place of repentance. Trials are not always fun. They're not always enjoyable, but they're beneficial. If you look at it the right way, If we're willing to accept the things that God lays in front of us because God allows these things to be in front of us. And this was an important lesson that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples in Mark chapter 12 and verse 12. Because it says, and they, they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that 
Jesus had spoken a word against them. And so because they knew that and they were offended at him, they left him and they went their way. The reason why they sought to lay hold on Jesus is because the word was reaching into their lives and pointing out areas where Jesus could make improvements if they let him because ultimately Jesus wanted to have a relationship with them, even though they rejected him. He just wanted to have a relationship with them. And so it is when individuals are confronted, confrontation should cause us and them and everyone to make a choice to correct our behavior patterns. But this isn't always the case. Repentance. We've been talking a lot about repentance and it's, it's an act of turning from our sins and turning toward Jesus Christ. Repentance, as we talked about a couple of weeks in our Bible study, is not always good because if we're not careful, we can repent backwards. And I've made that statement a couple of times. Why? Because the, world, the road to spiritual freedom can be hard to follow. And it might not be for you, but you know, it, it, it has been for me in the past. And sometimes when I'm walking in this world now, you see, there's a tendency to turn, to, to turn back and say, I'm just tired of this. God, don't you love me? And he loves you. He's just trying to get you to understand. He's trying to get you to see something. When a person repents, they're actually destroying everything they invested in in their former life. Something that they built, something that they worked on, and they realize when they come into the kingdom of God that typically God doesn't work like that. Now I ask myself, and we might ask ourselves, why do I have to go this way, Lord? Why can't I take the easy way? You might not have ever asked yourself that, but I have. Why, why can't I take the easy? Why does it always happen? Why do I always go through this stuff, Lord? And then I began to look in the Bible, and God began to give me some understanding. And he pointed me to, to Exodus chapter 8 and verse 28. Pharaoh did not fight against Moses when Moses wanted to leave. He didn't fight against him. He says, Moses, you can go. He just gave Moses some options. Pharaoh stated that I will let you go as long as you don't go far. Or in other words, as long as you are near, I want to see you. I want to be close enough where I can You see, falling away isn't falling away to another planet. Falling away could be as near as right next door. It says in Exodus 8, 28, And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far. Entreat for me. But you see, God knows better God told Moses, I want you to go a three days journey. Three days always represents the death, burial, and resurrection. God wants us to turn from sin. He wants to die out, and then he wants to resurrect us. But he can't do it still living close to where we were before. We have to allow God to destroy everything that influenced our life in the world we came out of. Does that make sense? And there are many areas which we can recover from. Listen to this. You, you have to get this. We can recover from rebellion. We can recover from slipping. We can recover from backsliding. But the Bible is very clear when a person falls away 
that there's no hope of recovering. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6 said, It is impossible to find your way back because they have allowed themselves to be deceived into believing they're okay when they're not. Falling away. Why is it impossible? Because in that area where they believe that they're okay, they have built their truth on another foundation. When this happens, the Bible is very clear as it describes two types of foundation. The first one is found in Luke verse 48, chapter 6. And it says this. It says, he is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the floods arose and the streams beat vehemently upon that house, it could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. There was some stability there. There was something solid there. It was a foundation that could not be moved because it was founded upon a rock. A rock in the Bible is always described as either God or God's word. And when your life is founded upon God's, wor God's word, you are building on a solid foundation. But 49 gives us a very different story. It says, but he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation who built his house upon the earth against which the streams did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and it was in ruin. And the fall of that house was great. Another version says it was built upon the sand. Both houses looked the same, but it was the foundation that was corrupted. So when the winds came and the storms beat upon that house, it fell, and the Bible says great was the fall of it. And so I think the Bible is very clear when it states for some there is no point of return because Mark chapter 3 verse 29 says, He, but he that shall blasphemy against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness but is in danger of eternal damnation. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 through 6 gives a little bit more detail because it says, For it is impossible... For those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, which is the Holy Ghost, and were made partakers of this heavenly gift, which is the Holy Ghost, and have tasted of the good word of God, which is building upon the foundation and the powers of the world to come, which is heaven, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. It is impossible, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him into open shame. In other words, he's saying, because people don't realize what God's word is doing for them, they continually go back and they're never able to, be, to have a stable relationship with God because they never let the word of God influence their lives. And so they're constantly in the church, out of the church, in the church, out of the church. And the Bible says every time we come back and repent, it's like putting Jesus back on the cross. It's like forsaking everything that he did. And Paul says in, 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 in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 5, verse 12, that you have to be taught the word of God over and over and over and over and over again. Because they're never able to come to the understanding 
They're never able to grow. He's always having to give them the bottle of God's word. They can never chew on meat. They can never grow. And therefore, they always struggle and they always go through trials. Every time something comes into their life, Because of that, they're never able to get, they're never, never able to establish a relationship with God. That's some powerful stuff. That's some powerful stuff. And then they begin to build something next to what was already or should have already been established in their life. That word fall away in the Greek simply means near, to build something near, to build a substitute. It looks like the same house. It feels like the same house. It brings you joy probably like the same house. But the Bible is, is implying that that person is living in a state of self-deception. Because now he can do whatever he wants. He doesn't have to listen to God's voice. And God sends him word again and again and again and again. And eventually, Jesus becomes an outcast. And that individual can never come to a place where he could be saved because he's already made up his mind. What he's doing is perfectly fine. Never able, never able to grow. And so Mark chapter 12 and verse 12 for they knew that he had spoken a parable against them and they left him and they went their way. Their way. They left. They were the keepers of the vineyard. They were there. God was trying to do something in their life. God was loving on them. God allowed them to, to be in his vineyard. God allowed them to work, but they never grew because they never allowed God to change them. And every time God sent them a word, it was like taking the Son of God and placing him on that cross. Again and again and again and again and again. So the writer of Hebrews is stating that the reason why it's impossible to be restored is because those who have fallen away have built their idea of truth on another foundation. Paul said it like this in the Galatians chapter one and verse six and eight. He says, I marvel. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into grace, the grace of Christ, unto another gospel. Something that makes you feel good. I was talking to an individual two nights ago. So excited. He was so excited, so on fire for God or what he knew about God. Man, Pastor Torres, I, it was so awesome. I went to the park and there was 60 gangbangers there and, 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 you know, God just compelled me to go back and just tell them about Jesus and I did and I prayed him through the sinner's prayer and in my heart, in my heart, I was grieving. Because now these individuals that believe they were saved might not ever come to the realization that they are missing the most important thing, and it's that heavenly gift. And how many people has this man 
altered the lives of individuals that are hungry and looking for God and someone comes and tells them, all you got to do is accept Jesus as your personal Savior. And I'm not, I'm just saying. Salvation is much deeper than that. It's not superficial, my friend. It's deep and it's powerful. Then it's something that you can root yourself into. Fortunately, uh, we're going to get together and we're going to have a Bible study. And I pray that God helps me. But Paul said, which is not another gospel, but, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the true gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. It looks like the gospel. It feels good when you read it. And I, I, I'll say this and I'll go out of limb. Even if the Holy Ghost wasn't real and even if it was a good book and even if you applied principles, your life principles of that good book, you could still have a good life, but you're still... Missing the most important ingredients, and that's the restoration of our spirit when God comes into human flesh. Yeah. You can't have God without having a spirit. We can't be saved unless we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. It's impossible. And yet, the writer of Hebrews says, those who have experienced this wonderful experience and have tasted of the good word of God. And they've had an opportunity of this heavenly place that God has prepared for them and they walk away. It's like blasphemy. It's like blasphemy. I'm, I'm not saying it. I'm, I'm trying to help us. I'm trying to get us to understand there are people in our world today that need foundational teaching. They need truth, praise God. You see, my friend, it is impossible to reinvent the will. It is impossible to reinvent the first principles of God. It's impossible to reinvent God's word because God's word is the beginning of this entire structure that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of. You have to build everything, everything on him he is the foundation. There's not another foundation. He's the only foundation. And the foundation that he laid, we build upon that foundation. It says we leave the first principles of the foundation what that is really saying is we don't go and do it over and over and over and over again. We grow and we develop and we mature off what God has taught us and how God has saved us, praise God. We don't go back and try to do it again, praise God. We believe God and we believe in his word, praise God, and we grow from there. And as we grow, we feed on the milk and we leave we feed on the meat and we leave the milk and we ought to be teachers instead of constantly having someone teach us. And that's what Paul was dealing with. That's what Paul was dealing with in Hebrews chapter 5 and 6. Ephesians 2, 19 
It says, now therefore we are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with saints and of the household of God. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ, which is the word of God, being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth, mature together unto a holy habitation, a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye, all of us, it's a plural, ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Holy Ghost, through his Spirit. Anytime anyone has ever built anything for God, they have to understand the letter, the word of God, the ABCs, if you will, of God. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse two says, ye are epistles, you are words, you are letters written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written with ink, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone that cannot be altered, cannot be changed, cannot be molded, but in fleshly tables of the heart where God can transform us and help us. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slack. He's not slack. He doesn't say something just to say something. He's not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. But his long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish. He is withholding judgment. But that all should come to Repentance. In other words, if we mess up and God has given us a promise, God doesn't take that promise from us. God wants us to realign and God wants to give us that promise, but we have to repent. We have to turn from our way and turn to God. And when we do that, we are in a position for God to continue the process of blessing us with the promise that he first gave us. <laughs> that is so awesome. That is so awesome. That's so awesome. Thank you, Jesus. I have a promise. And I don't know when that promise is going to be here. But God is not slack. Amen. Isn't God good? God is so, so, so awesome. He's so, so good. Praise God. He wants to bless us and he wants to help us be beneficial. Praise God. But we cannot allow ourselves to be affected by things that we don't understand. Just stay in the process. Stay in the work of God. Look at life through the eyes of eternity. You know, one setting that says the light, I, I, I probably can't even quote it, amen. Amen. Matter of fact, I'm not even going to try. Amen. Something about the light as it enters in. Amen. It's, it, 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 it basically shows us what we're made of. Amen. So whenever you react to somebody, that, that tells me what's on the inside of you. Is your vessel full of light? If it is, it's going gonna, it's gonna to protrude beautiful things and nice things and, and healthy things. If it's full of darkness, then that's going to be the result. I want good things for the people of God. I want good things for my family. I want good things for the world. I want people to see that 
that this church, amen, is a, is a good church, amen. It's a healthy church. It's a church that believes God, believes God's word, that, are, that is founded on the word of God. Amen. Do you want that tonight? Amen. I could go so much further, but I think we're just going to go ahead and stand. Amen.